cool. We need a little jingle. Mm -hmm. Like countdown, countdown jingle. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> we used to use Uber conference at DI. And so when you use Uber, there's this hot cold music that plays anytime you're the only person in the waiting room. I mean, we stopped using it two years ago, but I can still sing that waiting music to myself. And like, I find myself humming it. So y'all need something like that, where it's just like, whoa. Where's dealer refresh? Why am I singing this song for no reason in the middle of the day? <laughs> kind of horrifying inspiration because I prefer never to hear that song again, but. <laughs> we still have it somewhere. <laughs> yeah, just keep keep it down. Do our camera placements look good? Like, are are we looking weird to you guys, or anything like that? We need to know about. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> then I'm good. No, every, everyone looks great. We'll take it. What month is it? I swear. It's March. It's still March. I wish it was. I really do. I feel like the summer hasn't even started. I know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's do that. Yeah. No, that means we have to go through this again. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're gonna we're gonna fix things. I mean, yeah, bless it. Uh. <clears throat> <clears throat> You couldn't do it without you, Alex. <laughs> Thanks for having us back, Alex. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Setting the bar high right here. Got this. Here it comes. Well, sure. It's my least favorite subject, but why not? Um, so I'm the SEO director for Dealer Inspire. Um, you know, SEO is kind of like what DI started off doing. Um, but at this point, we have, you know, a, a department of close to 70 that's you know, overseeing both our connected marketing services, where we're delivering like monthly SEO services to our dealer base, as well as making sure that every single DI website we launch is following best practices and totally buttoned up from an organic front. Um, so I get to work with a pretty awesome, pretty large team of SEO badasses. I mean, that's, am I allowed to say that? Is that, am I gonna? Okay. Oh, hell yeah. For sure. Okay, <laughs> so it's too late now, because I did, but. Have you, have you heard the words that come out of Alex's mouth? <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently earlier they couldn't, I was <laughs> muted. No. <laughs> so they all got to miss my amazing Probably a show. good thing. Yeah, probably. <laughs> better to hear Mary Graves first anyway. 
Uh, <laughs> you don't want to open that floodgate. It turns into a pretty messy situation. <laughs> Not that pretty. was badass. Thanks. <laughs> so, David, what, uh, what? Actually, what? What got you started into SEO? Um, so, I actually graduated from college with a political science degree, which is like nothing, obviously related. Um, but it was right in the middle of like the world economy collapsing. So, I took a temp job at strong automotive merchandising in Birmingham, because that's where I was at the time, which they do automotive stuff. Um, and I <laughs> kind of like forced my way in the <laughs> SEO department. It was a brand new department to Strong at the time. In fact, they hired their interactive director, Gail. Um, I don't know if you all know Gail, but he's amazing. Like two months after I did, and I thought that everything he was working on was really, really fascinating. And so I kind of forced Gail to teach me things and then forced Gail to let me work with him, even though my job was something different. Um, and that really was what did it for me. I mean, I've floated around to a couple of other industries as well, but always keep coming back to marketing and SEO because it's right up my alley. I'm a data person. I'm a science person. Like, I like numbers. I like things that I can affect and, like, touch and impact. So I've tried the other things, but this is this is where I feel comfortable. So, yeah. Cool. Just kind of like serendipitously out of college was like, here we go. This is going to be a career. And here we are, like, what? I don't know how many years later, uh, over a decade later and still doing it. So. So you've been doing SEO or somewhere within that realm for a little over 10 years then? Yep. Yep. Happily. Excellent. I will say. <laughs> Good marriage. We like it. Yeah. So, David, tell me a little bit about yourself. Sure. Well, thank you. Um, firstly, it's good to see you fit and healthy. Um, with regards to SEO, I've been in the SEO space for the past 14 years, which really makes me feel old. Um, I've always been passionate about digital marketing. And the thing about SEO, SEO allows you to kind of dip your toe in all the digital marketing channels. I actually remember being at college and looking at code on my computer and thinking the girls would find it cool. Um, <laughs> we do. Who's to show how little I am at um, so, so I started in the SEO fields at a time when Google was just just in its infancy. Um, I, I was always curious about how to get to that number one, so I could get my own websites and um, ranking first. And so it's it's it served me well. Um, I've, I've dabbled in all the digital marketing channels and led them all. But I keep coming back to SEO because it's it's always keeps you on your toes. I was going to say, what what is it about SEO that just keeps you uh, gravitating back towards it? Well, well, like I said, it, it it allows you to be involved in all the digital marketing channels. You have, yeah. to, you have to know paid search, you have to know social, you have to know content marketing, mm -hmm. affiliate, so on and so forth. So it's that breadth of, of exposure to, to all the digital marketing facets that keeps me coming back. Not to mention, it's always changing, always changing. And additionally, it's, it, it tends to be the most important marketing channel within a business. And so it really gives you, from a career perspective, if anyone's listening and thinking about a career in SEO, it really um, gets you to the executive table. Um, you know, it really elevates your um, your stature within an organization. So it's, it's been great, it's been great for my career uh, and long may it continue. Yeah. Yeah, you're lucky yeah, to work in an answer. organization that likes SEO. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Yeah. Um, Not I'm all of them do. Yeah. One yeah. Of, you know, at least a company that takes it serious. Yes. Takes it very seriously, which we'll touch on in a second. Yeah. It's hard, though. I mean, just like dealers struggle with it. I mean, executives struggle with it as well because it's not instant, right? And it's not something that you can promise certain results. So it, it takes a, a level of finesse and it takes a level of trust from uh, committed businesses to understand the long-term game and the long-term strategy. But when they do, it pays off in spades. So It does. And if you get it wrong, um, which, yeah. again, we'll touch on, um, some of our com competitors have lost hundreds of millions of visits from due to their SEO channels and and that I can make or break a company. Yeah, for sure. What exactly, what does, you know, both of you have been in the game for 10 plus years. What exactly does SEO look like in 2020 compared to, to 10 years ago, especially within our industry? Well, I can, I can jump into that. So un understandably, SEO has taken a backseat um, to the overarching chaos since March. You know, people have had more things to worry about from, from employment to, to business survival to 
physical and mental health, um, not just for themselves, but their, for, for their loved ones. Um, but, but for 2020, there, there, there are two important things um, that, that the audience should be aware of. And that certainly relates to industry search behavior. And in particularly an algorithm update, another one uh, which occurred uh, back in May. Um, now, now dive in um, deeper into the industry trends and, and feel free, um, Jeff and Alex, to, to interject at any moment. But, you know, the auto industry and car dealerships, they're no strangers to, to a challenge. You know, I'm sure the, I'm sure many um, have fresh memories of the Great Recession of 2008 and cash for clunkers. I certainly do. Um, you know, the use of public transport has has declined. Ride hailing, which was which was hailed as as um, decimating the car industry. You know, these have declined substantially of late, and as a result, uh, car usage has rocket, rocketed um, since since March. You know, we're looking at close to 100 percent now of people say they now use their cars more more often. Now, what that, what's that, what that done has shifted um, search behavior, and 2020 has been um, historic. I don't want to say historic, because that's a bit of a, um, a, an aggressive term to describe. Um, well, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, maybe not. historic, yeah. But for, for search, you know, amazingly, search interests, you know, for example, is it a good time to buy a car? Um, that, that search, those search trends grew by close to to a thousand percent um after covid you know covid has influenced trends in particularly to, um, pushing search behavior towards deals towards a desire for digital convenience and service this is something that as an industry we've always discussed but i think covid has accelerated um digital digital convenience and service um by many years um from favorable incentives and record level financing not to mention the economic pressures that we're all aware of um the, the trends have have shown that people are looking for deals and, and deal related searches are up 70% post COVID. Um, interestingly, something I find to find interesting is that um, US search interests, search um, search trends for, for keywords such as dealerships near me or my local dealership have actually declined uh, by more than 20% after COVID. So what we're seeing, we're seeing an increase in a desire for, for car ownership, but at the same time we're seeing um, that, that desire for visiting the dealership um, decline, which is understandable. I mean, we're in the midst of a, a pandemic. Um, but but, but what, what that shows me is that people are looking for more convenience and they're looking for that service. In. And again, the search behaviors are showing us that. Um, searches for at-home test drive and review videos and digital showrooms, they're all increasing. Um, and as we'll touch on in a second, SEO is more than just Google. And before the pandemic, auto shoppers were turning to YouTube to experience digital test drives. And, and your listeners may want to increase their focus on this channel going forward in 2020, because like I said, the interest for car ownership is increasing. Um, but that interaction with the dealership um, is, is declining. And then finally, just at-home test drive and vehicle delivery Reads, um, th these searches and this desire um, were tied as number one uh, in terms of alternatives to visiting a car dealership. Um, so with these shifts in, in, in consumer behaviour, um, it's, it's been quite quite drastic. And then, of course, which we'll touch on in a second, there's the, an algorithm update was thrown into the midst of things, which 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 has been. Um, it, it was an absolute monster, uh, which I'll touch on in a second. After Google promised that they wouldn't in the middle of COVID, like they came out and they're like, we're, we're not going to shake things up. Like everyone has enough. And then they're like, ah, just kidding. Just kidding. You probably should have anticipated that. We had, um, we had Nick on last week with Flowfound and yeah. we're just looking at some of the different reports and, uh, and the climb, he offers a, uh, sort of a, a virtual reality test drive. Oh, cool. uh, and it was really interesting to see the, uh, the spike in numbers, uh, Pre-COVID, you know, up till now, uh, you know, and he was he was touching on a lot of search and running search campaigns uh, around the virtual test drive feature that he has. Um, and he was he was saying the same thing: a, a nice steady increase since COVID, um, with people just being more engaged with uh, video video test drives and, and his own product, the uh, the VR test drives. Yeah. And that's, and that's great innovation, and, and we're going to touch on it in, in, in a few minutes, content and the importance of content. You'd always hear about content in relation to SEO. And when we think of content, we always think about uh, written articles, but, but that, that is content. Um, that is great content, videos and VR test drives. That's t VR test drives, very innovative, but who knows that's where the future is heading. Now, David, you were 
you know, touching on the changes to what people are searching for. And it got me thinking that you know, maybe we should be expanding the kind of things that we're putting into our websites yes. so that we're, we're less about the local uh, shopper because our marketplace is now, you know, from one sea to the other and, and a southern and northern border. And you basically have the entire nation you can sell to. Yeah. Well, that, that certainly depends on, on the nature of the website. And, and but, but now with the time to adapt and change, I mean, over the next year at least, um, I, I imagine these search behaviors will persist. And people will continually look, be looking to engage with the dealership, but not go to a dealership. And so that really brings to the forefront, forefront um, online retail and those innovative um, levels of interacting with the consumer from, from videos and VR. I mean, VR sounds sounds um, so into the future, but, but you're going to start seeing that in, in yeah. the coming months. You, you're going to have to. Um, dealerships are going to have to adapt. Um, we're being pushed very aggressively into new frontiers. Yeah. And on the DI side, we're doing exactly that. I mean, again, right, dealerships traditionally have been so focused on that super low funnel buyer. You know, you have your marketing funnel and that bottom tip is where they want to focus. And that makes sense, right? But like, there are fewer people there. So this is exactly the time to say, all right, I can't change the number of people that are ready to buy a car today. But what I can do is time to pump so that when the people higher in the funnel begin to move down, I'm their first thought. And you that doesn't happen by magic. Right? Like people typically have a few dealerships that they know in their head, and those are going to be the first dealerships that they search when, once they're ready to buy a car. So you have to think like, how can I get my name in front of these consumers now before they're even technically in the search funnel or when they're really high? And you're going to do that by building out your service content. You're going to do that by, you know, talking about maintaining the car that they have. You're going to do that by helping them with their research process, even when it's not, you know, a ready to pull the trigger moment. Um, so dealers really pivoting their focus on exclusively focusing paid and SEO efforts on low funnel buyers and saying, no, I'm building a funnel. I'm going to go after these people. I'm going to help them research. I'm going to be their partner. And because I'm doing that, I'm going to get name recognition and, and brand growth, even outside of my local market. That's going to be the key. And those are the dealerships you're going to see be successful once people are ready to buy again. That's a, that's a pretty, probably a pretty extensive and maybe even expensive uh, uh, project to take on. Um, any recommendations? I mean, again, dealerships focus so much on on that buyer that's pretty much you know looking to purchase within the next week or so, uh, and dealers typically fail at the long term follow up, mm -hmm. long term marketing strategy. Um, you know, what are you guys seeing that's that's maybe successful? What approach are you guys taking with Cars.com and Dealer Inspire uh, to help dealerships overcome that that long term follow up, cultivating obstacle, whatever you want to call it. I mean, to your point about it being expensive, I, I'd say it's it's less expensive, really. Um, because you're you know, when you are focusing on SEO, you have very little immediate return, right? Like when you run a paid search campaign, you turn on the pipeline, you start getting leads today because your ads start showing up today. And that's amazing. But when you turn that money off, the ads stop showing, the leads stop coming in. With organic search, you're bolstering your, your online presence across the board. You're bolstering it through your website, through Google My Business, through your citation, through your reviews. So you start to get that benefit long term. And even if you stop paying for SEO, unless you have a shady provider that like removes their efforts, you're going to continue to get that month after month after month. And in fact, we have some stats on that that are pretty amazing. Um, so, you know, you could spend $10,000 a month on a DigiAd campaign, and that's absolutely a worthwhile investment. Absolutely, you're going to get those leads that are ready now. But in turn, with like DI, you could spend $2,000 on an SEO package and start slowly building out that content every month. And it's going to keep working for you. It's going to work every single month, and it's going to help you get low funnel and medium funnel and high funnel buyers. And it's significantly less than what most dealers spend on DigiAd for much longer, more sustainable results. I would agree with that. I, I guess for me, it's you know, I've, I, 
I used to be really headstrong into uh, into SEO, and and I guess my focuses and priorities have changed over the past uh, several years, just for the fact that so many other larger companies, um, so many larger publishers that have you know <laughs> yeah. way way larger budget than than what we would have here at a car dealership, it's just so difficult to compete with the large publishers, you know. So so how how does the dealership you know, get onto the front page for some maybe, you know, long tail uh, keyword strategy, but doesn't necessarily include, uh, you know, a geo location. Maybe it's not my backyard because, uh, you, you know, what you said earlier, get in there, get in front of the customer at an earlier stage. But it's, it's, again, it's just so difficult for a dealership to be able to battle and go up against these these larger entities. It is. I mean, there's, you know, I don't know if I should say this or if, if Joe's going to slack me and say, what are you saying? But, I mean, I, I used to have nightmares about, like, cars and auto trader prior. Because, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, they are. Like, it's hard to beat those guys. It's hard for a dealership to beat out an aggregator. But the thing is, it's so much harder to beat them for a VDP than it is to beat them for service content, for localized content, for, um, you know, what are the color options on the Camry? Um, so I can only speak, of course, to like our SEO strategy at DI and what we see and not what other providers do, but it's extremely common and extremely consistent that we see in local markets when we are writing these pieces of content for our dealers about I mean, again, my default, my team will tell you, as I always say, the color options on the Camry because I can never come up with something better off the cuff. But when we're writing about those kinds of like hyper specific topics, um, we do beat the aggregators and we beat the OEM sites because dealer or uh, Google will give preference in the algorithm to local content that serves a local dealer uh, to a local buyer, even if the topic is national. Um, and we absolutely have dealers who kill it and end up ranking nationally for those same kinds of topics. But, you know, if I'm searching as a user for a specific question, cars will typically, and I mean, David, correct me if I'm wrong, but when I've checked it out, but we'll have, you know, a very long form, long article covering the color options and a hundred different things. Whereas on a dealer website, what we do is we hyper-focus the technical signals and we hyper-focus the content on that one topic. So it's specifically related to that search and its semantic relations excuse me, hiccup cough. Um, and it performs really well because of that. And then we build out a whole network of related queries. Like, all right, so after they're talking about the color options, what are they going to want to see next? Okay, and after they see that, what are they going to be interested in researching next? And we try to like, really systemically build them through and take them down that funnel so they don't have to leave the website. They have all the information there. Um, but it is, it's hard to beat out the aggregators, but it is possible if you optimize it the right way and if you think through um, what people in your specific market are looking for, make sure you're putting that content on your website first. And then I think you also have to pick your battles. So a lot of times dealers do want to be number one for Toyota Camry near me. And the reality, it is going to be cars.com. It's going to be your cars.com listing. So I think you have to just change your perspective and say, that's okay. That's why I have a cars.com profile. They're awesome. They're an aggregator. And you make sure that you have optimized the hell out of your auto trader, your cars.com websites, that you have done everything you can to get those profiles to be accurate, up to date, really engaging, have USPs, have accurate photos, so that your dealership is the choice that they go to once they go from Google to your cars listing. I don't know if David feels differently, but that's what we see. Well, I was, I was going to add to that, and it's something that we'll touch on in a few minutes, that, you know, SEO is not just Google. You know, if I was if I was Jeff at dealerrefreshdealer.com, I'd be looking at other verticals to, to hijack the search results. Take a look at YouTube, for example, if you have some relevant video content, that's a great way of piggybacking ahead of um, – the, the, the big guys um, look at Twitter, for example, Twitter search, you know, you can go in there and you can examine keyword research and make sure you're showing up for relevant content and um, Yelp, so on and so forth. There are other verticals out there that you can take advantage of to get ahead of the big guys. I would say take a look at your comp your local competition too and see where they're weak. Even look at the big guys. You know, what, where are we failing? Um, because smaller, smaller organizations can get things done very quickly uh, and can, can really, um, 
develop these innovative solutions that can can leapfrog um, some of the big guys. But I will say, look at other verticals. It's, SEO is not just Google. Yeah. And before the show, Mary Grace, you were sharing some numbers that have changed uh, over time here. So yeah. A few years ago, Google was like, what, 94%, 96% of the, the searches being done in the United States? I know they yeah. still hold there internationally. Yeah. What's changed? Um, so, I mean, people are just getting more familiar and used to other search engines. I think a lot of it goes to the, the privacy conversations and trying to think outside of, you know, the search engines they're used to using for some of those concerns. Um, but thank you to Kara Garvey, who helped me find these numbers, because she's my role model, and I love her. She's our paid search director, and she's, she's everything I want to be when I grow up. Um, but she found this uh, data for me and threw it my way. And it, I mean, it just shows the giant change that we've seen in Bing. But Bing is up to like 6.25% of, of global search share right now. And, you know, we're talking where it was like three, maybe 4% five years ago. And that's a, that's a huge change. Um, the other ones are, you know, basically holding steady some small changes. But really, this is the time to start figuring out, especially with your paid dollars too, like, don't just focus on on Google. Move some of your paid dollars to Bing. Number one, you'll probably get a much better cost. But number two, there are people there ready to buy. I mean, it's Google is obviously continues to be critical and it's important. And I I don't believe that you need to optimize differently for a Google search engine versus a Bing search engine. I think you do what is best for the user and make that your priority, and the search engines will follow. So it's not like you need to change your search strategy if you're trying to focus on Bing versus Google, but you need to pay attention to the metrics on both. You need to pay attention to how your consumers are shopping and what search engines they're showing up in and how you're ranking on each one and you know, how, how are you showing. Um, and a lot of times we forget about that. We prioritize Google so much that everything else falls aside and 6% is not anything to sneeze at. That's, that's great. Uh, Drew yeah, Amen just posted that uh, Bing's over 7% now. Well, wow. all right. Well, I take back what I said if Kara sent me. <laughs> I'm kidding. But yeah. No, it's, 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 exactly, though, right? If we're talking about numbers that are changing this fast, that's amazing. And that's something that I think speaks to the testament of paying attention to what's going on and not thinking about what we knew to be true a few years ago and really reevaluating what you're doing and why you're doing it every month, every two months to make sure it matters to what's happening today. That's a good point. Is there a particular uh, demographic that, that Bing is attracting? David, I don't know. Well, they're in voice search for Alexa, for example, right? Bing, yeah. Okay. Bing, folks, mm. Bing folks tend to, to skew more towards female, the female audience. Um, what you'll find is that Microsoft devices tend to, by default, as a search engine, um, gravitate towards uh, Bing. Uh, and, and Bing is, is more of a shopping orientated uh, um, search engine. Yeah. So if you are going to look at demographics, it is going to be more skewed towards more towards the female shopper, and and female shoppers are, are just as relevant um, to our industry um, as male shoppers. And also, oh, probably, probably more relevant. <laughs> probably more relevant. You're correct. You're correct. Yeah. Uh, and a little bit older too, which again I think just goes towards the security of a being shopper. Like they are financially stable, they know what they're looking for, they're ready to come into the dealership, they're probably looking for a more traditional experience. So you can consider those kinds of things as well. And and remember with analytics, you can also kind of segment through your leads to see where those are coming from and see how your people are, are getting to your site and how they're submitting those forms and, and converting on your site. It seems there's a growing number of people who are growing more and more untrustful of Google. I'll raise mm -hmm. my hand as being one of them. Um, yeah. The only Google device left in my house is uh, a Google Voice or Nest or, wh or whatever the little hub thing is. And it's just because their voice yeah. assistant is fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. But I've moved to DuckDuckGo for everything else and just can't, yeah. Like they, they killed... Uh, <laughs> Uh, they killed so many other products and, and then uh, products that I used to rely on. And like the Google My Business page, I'm leery to get excited about that just because they've gone through how many iterations of business pages and things. And maybe that'll go away tomorrow. Who knows? Hey, Mary, you've got your mute on. Oh, I'm muting myself. I love why we've seen so many iterations from Google. 
So like, yeah, it's super frustrating that we're all like, okay, Google places, that's the thing. Let's, let's focus on that. And then it disappears or, you know, whatever. There's been a million examples, but it proves that it's a company that's committed to innovating. And I think you're going to see that with any company that's committed to doing a good job and to committed to, um, giving consumers what they want and need. And obviously it's a self-serving purpose as well. Let's not pretend, <laughs> but, uh, I, I don't know. I get excited about stuff like that. And that's something we have a, uh, a team, we have our, our local search team that's part of our SEO team, but they're like hyper focused on like Google My Business changes and local changes and stuff like that. And we're checking for those kinds of updates and tests that we can play around with. And it is frustrating. It's like, all right, they're going to spend a lot of business hours investing in this and putting our clients through the ringer to see what impacts we can have here. And then it might go away next week. But you can also learn a lot from what Google is prioritizing by the kinds of things that they are rolling out, right? Like, they rolled out Q&A on the GMB profile. Why did they do that? It wasn't arbitrary. It's because they wanted more information on the direct kinds of questions that Google are asking. You don't ask a question in a review. You ask a question in a Q&A. And that coincided, if you'll remember, when Google's search trends spiked for Q&A style content. Not coincidence. And it's a learning opportunity if you're paying attention to it. So it's frustrating. And I, I totally get it. But I, I, I like the commitment that it shows on Google's behalf to continuing to iterate and kind of push the bounds. And, you know, selfishly, I want everyone to keep using Google because it makes <laughs> it a little bit easier, but that's okay. Before we jump into this new algorithm that they released, what are, um, and maybe you have an answer to this, maybe you don't, but are there some different, uh, I guess, keyword terms that you find more, that are being used more and more by the consumer? Maybe some terms that, you know, you mentioned something earlier, uh, I guess the term, is it a good time to buy a car? Yeah. So I guess I guess that's sort of a term that's been uh, uh, being searched out more often than maybe it was just six or seven months ago. Um, mm -hmm. Have you tracked any other terms or, and or what should a dealership even uh, be optimizing for those particular terms? Well, I'd say, Prior to COVID, um, near me search terms were, were, were very popular. Dealership uh -huh. near me, used car near me, new car near me. Um, since, as I mentioned, post COVID, those near me searches may ha have dropped, and I think we're in a we're in a fuzzy zone right now in terms of finding out, in terms of understanding what is happening. Uh, because things are being thrown up into the air and there's the snow globe has been shaken and I don't think the snowflakes have settled yet to where we know what the new terms are um, because it's changing every day, every week, every month. Um, who would have known that that for VR test drives would be increasing uh, mm -hmm. just a month ago? I, I'd find that hard to believe. So pre-COVID, it was very local orientated. Um, now it's, 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 it's that... Connect, connecting with the dealership without going to the dealership. Those mm -hmm. terms would take priority in the next few months, I believe. Well, that's a big interesting idea. word choice, David. <laughs> throwing the snowflakes <laughs> up. Yeah, I like the, the snow globe analogy. Crack me up a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what are, um, within the dealership website environment, what particular areas should a dealership be focusing on for their SEO strategy? You know, I know back in the day, it was uh, all dealerships should have a blog, you know, and we've got a couple, quite a few platforms. As a matter of fact, Dealer Inspire being one of those, um, really focused on the blog platform uh, for their SEO strategy. I believe Dealer On was another one. Um, and I'm sure there's a few more out there. Do blogs, does, does that really make sense for a dealership to utilize some type of blog strategy for their SEO moving forward? I mean, kind of, right? So like Dealer Inspire platform has a blog because it's convenient for users. And the theory is that anything that's evergreen to your website, you should create as a page. Right? It, it's not going anywhere like how to change your oil. Your, mm -hmm. unless we go through a new revolution. The way you change your oil is pretty consistent. Whereas something that is less permanent, you should have as a post, post as a blog post. Posts are date stamped users can reference that date to understand if this content is in date or out of date. Like that's kind of why there's a difference. It's not that Google prioritizes a post versus a page in a different way or anything like that at this point in time. It's content and it can be optimized a similar way. It's laid out a similar way. Um, 
create it in a similar amount of time. I think what dealers need to be focusing on is the areas of their business and the content to support the business that they need help on. Um, and traditionally, they've always wanted to focus on sales, but now we're seeing a huge focus on trade-in campaigns, which is where it should be. We need to get dealers the used cars that they need, and we need to get dealers the inventory that they need. And then service. We just did a webinar recently about how you can you know, create a cohesive connected marketing strategy specifically for your service department. We've seen a lot of dealers really getting excited about that because that's where they need to recoup their dollars. If they're not selling new cars and used cars are still hard to come by, their service department is where they can make their money back. That's how they can stay afloat right now and really continue to be prosperous. Um, but you're competing against people down the road and that's all they do. Like Bob's Collision Center it typically is outranking the dealership's collision center. Pet Boys, their local Pet yeah. Boys, are outranking the dealer service department. But it doesn't have to be that way. If you put a cohesive strategy together to bolster your presence there and build out that content. And that's the other thing, too. A lot of times we see dealers who are like, no, but I have a service page. It's like, yeah, mm -hmm. you have a service page. They have one an page. entire sort of website. Like they, have, they have a whole site about this, and you have one page. You're not going to beat them. You need to build out a uh, of content here. Dealers have always been notorious for, uh, you know, their dealership websites being about Sale. 90 to 95 percent sales and 5 percent service. Which makes uh, sense for pre-COVID, but that's not where we are today. Well, I mean, I don't, you know, I wouldn't agree with you there. I don't think it made sense for pre pre-COVID as well. I mean, it's uh, again, like you you mentioned earlier with Pet Boys, you got all the uh, these third-party service providers out there that are just, you know, they're crushing it when, yeah. it, when it comes down. And dealerships have sort of always rested on their laurels, I guess, and the fact that you know, I guess they just assumed that the consumer. Uh, knows that they have a service department and, you know, with cars being under warranty, they're allowed to be lazy and know that they're going to get the customer at least to come back for, for warranty. And hopefully that turns into, uh, you know, your normal maintenance program. Uh, but the reality is that's not, you know, it's just not true. Yeah. Uh, and you have your used car shopper who's sitting at home with a car without a warranty and they're not even yeah. considering the dealership as a service center destination. Like that's not top of mind. Well, and the one thing I always found, you know, the average consumer thinks that the 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 mechanic down the street or the Pep Boys or Grease Monkey is going to be cheaper than the dealership. I mean, yeah. they've got that perception. And the reality is, a lot of times, that's not the case. Yeah. Not the case at all. It's, you know, there's a lot of times uh, the dealership could be cheaper or priced right beside of them, but then you get a much better peace of mind going yeah, to the real dealership. Parts. Or OEM yeah. parts, let's say. Yeah. yeah. All and like things. trustworthy so, trade. Yeah, so yeah. The average consumer doesn't, they, I don't think they take those things in, into account. So there's a, like you said earlier, Mary Grace, that's a that's a great opportunity to build out content to educate the, uh, the consumer on the service end. Yeah. But you have to be willing to be a little bit vulnerable too. Um, you know, dealers, there's this weird dichotomy where dealers want the leads and they want the conversions and absolutely we respect that. Yeah. The users want the user experience, right? They want to go to the website and find the information that they want without blockers or hurdles. And there's always been that friction that exists. So what we encourage our dealers to do is put the information out there. Don't do this, you know, let's put a tiny snippet of information or really generic content and then say click to call for real details. All they're going to do is leave. they're not going to call and be like, well, you convinced me. Now I'm going to call like, you're just going to leave and go find the answer at whoever's actually posting the answer. So you have to, you know, dealers have to get uncomfortable and be a little vulnerable. Put the information that consumers want out there. We're talking about price. Easy way to prove that you're cheaper or on par with dealers on the street. Put your prices on your website. Put them on your products tab of your Google My Business listing. Put them on the service tab of your Google My Business listing. Explain how comprehensive your services are. You have this information. Consumers want it. If you put it, they will they will come to you. They will convert. They will trust you. If you don't, they're going to go somewhere else. We've are, we're already uncomfortable since COVID, so why not What's do a, a few more worse? things that stay uncomfortable? Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's actually really good advice. So, it's it, hard, but yeah. it helps. The uncomfort it's, it's, helps to innovate, for sure. Yeah. It's definitely an angle we've taken here because we're, we're a smaller bed store. We're right outside the D.C. Baltimore market. But our, our labor rate is anywhere from anywhere from eight to to to, to eighteen dollars cheaper per hour. 
wow. uh, up against the uh, the Northern Virginia DC uh, dealers. So I mean, a consumer can drive 45 minutes to an hour and save you know a significant amount of money on on their scheduled maintenance uh, just you know just by driving a short short period. So uh, you know, I've taken some time and really you know build out some SEO campaigns around that. And it's it's uh, our, I mean, our service department is never not busy. That's awesome. And never and and we're never that busy with consumers that are coming from the DC Baltimore metro area. I'm in the DC area too, and I was having this exact conversation with my neighbor last night, and it wasn't work related at all. She went to get her car detailed. I, I think it's about half an hour. I can't remember which dealership. About half hour away from where we live, because she could get something done at a dealership she trusted. She got her car detailed um, for a discounted price because she had purchased there, and she's like, "It's completely worth it because it's I, I trust them. I know them, even though it's out of the yeah. way. People are willing to drive for services that they know about to dealerships that they trust. You can totally, oh, yeah. Yeah. especially if they're going to save a few bucks doing it. Yeah, why not? Yeah." Yeah, it's been a, it's been an effective campaign for us, that's for sure. Yeah. So you mentioned. Fourth? Yeah, I was going to say. Well, leading up to this, this for a while now. Wonderful <laughs> update. Yes, um, Google likes to keep us on our toes. Um, another week, another reason why why many may may not trust them. But on, on May the fourth, um, Google made another update. It was another another core update. It fully rolled out um, on the eighteenth of May. It was an absolute monster. It was a beast. Uh, insert your own keyword there. Um, the auto the auto category was was reasonably hit. So why does that matter to, to you guys and those listening right now? Well, well, that impact will impact um, that update will impact you directly from an organic standpoint. You know that that, that dip you see in your traffic from May onwards, and um, it may not necessarily be due to COVID. Um, it could be most likely because of this update. In terms of when we zoom out from a from an industry perspective, and we look at some winners and losers uh, post update, it's surprising that there were not many winners. Um, in fact, the the majority um, within uh, the competitive set that we examine, the majority were losers, um, with the exception of ourselves. Um, in, in terms of looking at some SEO traffic and, and the, the, the stats that I reference right now are taken from a, a website called Hrefs, and that's spelled A-H-R-E-F-S dot com. Um, you, can, you, can, you can check this data yourself. Um, you can actually get a subscription for seven bucks um, for, for, for a week. Um, but, but taking a look at some of those that, that, that won and lost, you know, looking at Carfax, for example, they, uh, they made my, my eyes um, open wide. Uh, they lost 42% of traffic. Um, SEO traffic um, following uh, May's court, uh, May's update. Uh, that's substantial. Uh, that really opened up my eyes. Car gurus saw a decline of over 30%. Uh, and again, that's that, that's a, a narrative which was always baffles me. Um, since um, looking back 18 to 24 months, um, their traffic has declined close. Their SEO traffic has declined close to 60%. And we mentioned earlier, Jeff, how you know SEO can make or break an organization when you're losing 60% of your SEO traffic. That's that's hundreds of millions of visits to your organization. Um, looking at TrueCar, TrueCar lost over 30% of their SEO traffic. Um, also, Trader saw a decline of up to 20%. Um, CarMax didn't see much change. Edmunds saw a little lift. Um, I think they saw a close to 10% increase in their traffic. Um, looking at Kavana and Vroom, um, the, the, the new players in town, um, they saw moderate lifts. Um, they saw moderate lifts, but nothing um, as substantial uh, as what I just mentioned. Um, you know, Kavana and Vroom, uh, they actually have very low organic traffic. Uh, their, their, their monthly SEO traffic probably represents 1% of our SEO traffic each month. Um, so, so the fluctuations are kind of, kind of difficult to discern. Um, Is that just because they don't have a strong strategy around it, or that's that's, that's more... <laughs> I mean, it's you know, I'd say you know they're they're new on the scene. Uh, their, their their content breadth um, is, is is quite um, light in, in comparison to our own. Um, they they're, they're targeting a specific audience, um, a very niche audience. Um, so they don't have the breadth in terms of the reach that that ourselves and some of those competitors I mentioned have. Um, but, but that may change. That that may change. Um, well, I know they're they're pretty effective with with their uh, with their social strategy mm -hmm. uh, and social campaigns. And of course, again, like you said earlier, all of this ties into SEO nowadays. It's not just that on-page content. Yeah, that's, that's true. Um, 
and, and who knows, um, again, COVID is shifting that narrative. Um, we're seeing increases, but they're not significant yet. Uh, but who knows where they'll take us and why does that matter to, to, to those to, to, to those listening you know but if, if you're you know if, if you're investing uh, in some of these organizations and then they're seeing 60 percent declines you know that's that, that's that's a concern uh, but in terms of our in terms of ourselves um you know I, I don't gloss over ourselves you know looking back at march you know it, it seems so long ago when, when used vehicle sales were dropping by 50 percent versus january and you know tra traffic across the industry was plummeting in march you know it, it was horrific it was a horrific month uh, not to mention concerns about our health and employment and our businesses it was it was horrific um so it's surreal to highlight that us and cars as a business we saw our overall traffic for Q2 increased by 10%. Our SEO traffic for Q2 was actually a record. Uh, it was it's the highest ever um, that our organisation has ever seen. Uh, we hit close to 40 million um, SEO visits um, for Q2. So April, May, June. Uh, again, it's surreal to think that back when looking looking from through the lens back in March. Um, SEO traffic in June was, 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 a, was a record month for us. Um, it, it continues to be an important distinction between ourselves and, and our competitors. You know, it's, and especially during these times where a number of our competition are cutting back on their marketing spends. Um, it's, it's, it's critical and it's been critical for our business to have that organic traffic uh, to really separate us from our competition. And it, it, in terms of you know, what, dro what drove this success, you know, for the past two years, each of these algorithms them updates and again you can look at the you can from hrefs to, to similar web um, um com score that they all show the same trajectories and our, our seo traffic has just increased and it's never been hit by these these algorithm updates um and, and that's just an objective fact uh, that's not just me uh, being biased in terms of what we're doing of late to drive that success yes our seo strategy is paying off which i'll touch on in a second but you know other other factors are, are, are contributing to that from you know shifting online car shopping behavior to consumer demand and of course our content which, again we'll touch on the our content in a second content is key for everyone listening if you want to win in this game it comes down to content and i do feel that is that is separating us from our competition when 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 our competitors when the majority of our competition lost in may's core update and we won significantly i do believe it's because we excel um with, with regards to our content and you can you can draw your own conclusions when you look at our sites so in terms of what can you do to fix things if you saw if anyone listening saw a horrific decline in their traffic um what can you do to fix things unfortunately um, Google says there's nothing you can do. What that, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, but, but to help explain that, you know, you know, Jeff, Alex, if I were to ask you back in 1999, you know, what what were your top favourite films of all time? Um, I'm sure you would have Titanic in that list, Jeff. Um, you'd look at Titanic. <laughs> Maybe Pretty Woman, Alex. I think you might have have Ghost, Patrick Swayze's Ghost. <laughs> oh, totally, totally. <laughs> I, I was thinking more Roadhouse. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, so let's say you made your top 10 list back in 1999. If I were to ask you today what your favorite films are, your top 10 favorite films are, that list will change. You know, Pretty Woman would have fallen down the list um, for you, Alex. Titanic may have fallen down or increased with time. But that, that's not to demote these films. You still love these films. You still enjoy these films. It's just that different variables, different films have come into the mix and has all, and have altered the search results. So that's why Google always says you don't, you, there's nothing you can do because in theory there's no, nothing is you can do, it's just different variables coming into the mix. Um, but with, again, we'll touch on content, which, which is key, um, but what do the winners have in common? Um, it, it is that strong backlink profile and that investment in high content. Expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthy content. You know, when you're, look, when you're looking to build out content on your website, it can't be just content that you copy and paste from another website. It has to stand out from the crowd. Does your content, and Google, if, if you were to Google this, Google provides a list of 20 questions that you can ask yourself. Uh, and you can do this for your own website. Does your content provide original information? Would people want to bookmark that information? Would you feel comfortable sharing this information with professors? And would you, does the content display well on mobile devices? Does it provide substantial value? So on and so forth. And, and when, when your content checks these boxes, 
that's when you're going to start seeing increases in results. Now, at every stage, and then just to wrap this up, because I know um, Mary Grace wants to touch on our, on our um, SEO guidebook, which is a great example of um, uh, content. At, at every stage uh, in the user and dealer journey, you know, we we as an organization, we instill that trust, um, which is key. It's, it's, it's ingrained in our organizational culture. Uh, and at Cars, we put the user first. And I, I say this to my SEO team always, um, if you put the user first, you're going to be repaid with solid SEO results. And that's one thing you can just take away if you want to win the SEO game, to put the user first. We put our dealerships first and repaid with loyalty and partnerships and businesses and business. And yes, I am biased, obviously, but I do objectively believe that we, we are the best platform in terms of not eroding margins for, for our dealerships. You know, we, we have that trust instilled. I'd say every other business model sells against the dealer. They erode profits to create the app value for themselves first you know they put themselves first those, those are harsh words but when you look at true car you know they, they notoriously advertise that you can't trust the dealer that's not going to help your bottom line uh, across the boards back in february car gurus were steering those selling and trading um trading into kavana you know how does that um how does that promote trust um and CarMax at the same time, interestingly, CarMax, you know, became part owner of Edmunds. How is that going to um, promote that trust between dealerships uh, and, and these marketplaces? Uh, and so finally, just to say that we value trust and that trust and putting the user first, putting the dealership first. When that permeates throughout your organization, it trickles down to, um, to your channel, such as SEO. And that's why we're seeing these record breaking results, um, which, which is great. You fight the good fight. Um, you put the user first. And you win, um, you win SEO. Well, I know back in the day, I mean, of, of all the different, I guess, uh, publishers out there, um, there's two things that I always kept an eye on with cars.com uh, that I always felt as if you guys had to leg up because you started in on the game so early, uh, with, of course, SEO being one of those. Um, I know you guys had, if I can recall, three or four, and this was I mean, this was 10 plus years ago, if not longer. Um, you really got into some of the uh, the different publishing, um, I don't want to say services, but I think you had uh, some different blog platforms, um, some different online publishing platforms that you guys, not platforms, but uh, uh, companies that you acquired. Uh, I know at one point you had some something to do with moms and cars. There was a separate blog for that. Um, there was uh, there was a couple of different ones, and of course, through that time, you acquired uh, was it newcars.com, mm -hmm. uh, and then also auto.com. Um, but I remember you having an array of different blogs out there that you were constantly contributing uh, new content to, and I can't remember one of the very first um, SEO managers at cars.com. I think his name is, I'm thinking Eric, but again, this was 15 plus years ago. We can call um, him. Yeah, we can call him that. I have to go back and look. Um, we had a pretty, a pretty good relationship again, but it was just so long ago. But, but those things have really paid off for you guys now because you had, and and like you were saying earlier, SEO is such a long-term strategy. You know, so you know something that you got into, and that's that's what makes it such a difficult sale to car dealerships. Like, look. Here's something you're going to do now, but it's going to pay dividends three years, four years, you know, possibly five or six years from now. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, unfortunately, it's not a car this month or not a car sold today. Uh, then the other one is, is you guys were really one of the first companies out there to really take mobile so serious, um, especially with your, your, your mobile app platforms, which you've probably got three or four different different ones out there um, and and I'm sure you're seeing that you know pay off drastically with uh, with SEO as well yeah and it's definitely I mean mobile has been key uh, it represents 75 percent of our traffic and I, I think the key to, to our success has just been evolution you know I go back to the film analogy you know Goodfellas for me was it would be my top 10 lists back in 1999 and it's still in my top 10 and um, because it's just it's just lasted um, the test of time and for an SEO program you just have to continually evolve and we've always been on top of change you know that's the price you pay for growth 
and we continue to be changing and we continuously will be changing just and, and that's why we don't get dinged by these algorithm updates because we keep evolving and, and from a from a on an individual level a, a, as a dealership you know i do think you can drive results um, quickly from an seo standpoint i'd say within a month if you were to invest some seo energy um it, it, you could see results um if you put the time in and, and it doesn't have to be a significant amount of time and mm -hmm. you can see results quite quickly in an from an seo standpoint um, so i'd certainly encourage, I'd certainly encourage kind of defeats that myth of it you you won't see results for six months or something right like, it, takes a while to continue to build up that authority, but David's exactly right. On a dealership website, you can you can get things going quickly, and we've got a whole blog with some numbers in there. I'd encourage everyone to check out on dealerinspire.com. Quick plug. David, David, you mentioned a movie earlier, but you, you glossed over it. What, what movie were you talking about? You, you strike me as more of a Flash Gordon type of guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if my accent is um, butchering um, the way I say good fellas. Maybe I can say it in a. Okay, good fellas. All right. Good fellas. Good fellas. <laughs> Doesn't quite match the movie there. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> so, you guys have put together an SEO guide. Uh, we've been posting it occasionally in the comments. I'm going to post it again in a moment here. So, what was the inspiration? Yeah. So this is pretty cool. And, and again, for like David and I on the geeky side, or if we've kind of had this uphill battle for people to take SEO seriously and believe in all of its value. This was, I don't know, I, I heard this and I got out of my chair and I was doing a little dance and it's kind of embarrassing, but uh, cars surveyed their dealer base of about 18,000 dealers about like, well, what do you want to hear more from us about? What, it, what What's the information you're missing? And it came back pretty overwhelmingly that the, the, thing that they wanted to hear more about is SEO. They want more thought leadership on SEO. They want to understand it better. And all of that's a direct impact from COVID, I think. Um, something, you know, interesting, everyone was in the middle of COVID and trying to figure out how to shift their dollars around so that they could keep selling the cars that they could, but conserve money and keep their staff on. And that, that's a righteous battle. Um, but, you know, we saw what was going on and we knew like, this is the time to double down. It's hard to do that, but this is the time to double down. And I wanted to quickly call this out because I think it's cool. Um, we, we looked at our clients who paused SEO services or who canceled SEO services with DI versus those who kept their SEO services. And this is this is in the, the uh, paper, but, you know, calling it out um, from May to April or from April to May. So again, like really in the heat of the pandemic, the clients who kept their SEO services going and kept adding content and kept building out their website saw a 10% lift in organic traffic and a 114% increase in organic conversions. Um, but even those that paused saw a 2.5% increase and a 51% increase in, or, uh, in conversion. So like neither number is one to quit at, but just shows the value of continuing to invest in SEO. Um, yeah, sorry. Now I don't remember because I wanted to make sure I said that. Now I don't remember what I was saying before. <laughs> what? <laughs> Does it does it still hold true that your organic traffic typically has a higher conversion point uh, or a higher conversion rate than than your paid? Yeah. And do you also see that with with cars.com? Because as you know, as you were mentioning earlier, uh, just everything that you guys have put into SEO over the years is, you know, of course, has really paid off. Anytime there's a new algorithm change in Google, uh, you guys continue to excel and and, and climb the the ranks. Um, and I'm assuming that, that that helps out with conversion as well because, again, typically you'd see a higher conversion point with your organic traffic. Well, I would say, Jeff, it's it's an interesting question. I think uh, across many industries, pay search does actually have a high conversion rate because it's more targeted. Um, SEO is different in, in the sense that it spans different levels of the funnel. So at the top, uh, that, that the top of the funnel, you have researchers who are not necessarily going to convert. You know, they're reading news articles, they're doing research, and um, so so SEO typically tends to um, typically um, SEO tends to be um, less converting than the paid search. Okay. On dealer websites, though, I actually see the other. Uh, we see our organic channel converting higher a lot of times than our paid search channels, um, even with the higher funnel. You know, and, and a lot of that's a numbers game, right? Like we have mm -hmm. more organic traffic, so proportionally it's not surprising to then also get 
more uh, conversions, but we do. We do consistently see organic getting more than paid. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a different marketplace. Like what, and that's, again, I think the importance of having a connected strategy because, you know, when you're combining your efforts between paid, between the aggregators, between, you know, review platforms like Dealer Rater and between an organic search strategy focused on your business, you can really hit it from all sides. So mm -hmm. you think about the SERPs today, remember back in 2019, they rolled out an algorithm update that essentially said, look, one website's going to show up one time for a single query. Whereas before that, you could show up like two, three, your new page, your used page. You could have mm -hmm. a variation. And now really, you're going to have one page for a query. And it makes it harder. The SERP is more diverse. Oh, sure. yeah. That's what users kind of sucks for us. <laughs> so <laughs> if you want to show up more often organically and increase those conversions no matter what channel it's coming from, you've got to play on a bunch of different channels to increase your odds of being somewhere on that page. Um, at Cars, we kind of have the trifecta, um, where your generator profile shows up, your cars.com listing shows up, your website shows up for a query that's relatively low funnel. And we see that happen a lot when we have dealers running you know, all of our services. Uh, but that's what you need for that visibility. Otherwise, you're cutting your chances and, and to thirds. If you're only showing up yeah. once as opposed to showing up four times, like, come on, inundate me. Let me see that you're there. But yeah, for sure. So... There's a car, you're a car dealership, you, up to this point, you've had little to zero uh, SEO strategy. Um, you've always relied maybe just on paid search. Uh, you don't have a blog. You don't, you know, maybe you've got a decent social presence. Maybe you've put more effort there uh, than, than SEO. Um, what would you recommend to that dealership? Where should they get started? I know we talk a lot about content, but we really haven't gotten overly specific other than videos and of course really focus on your service side um you know some good instructional or you know why buy me messages especially again from the service side uh what would you say to that dealership that is just sort of starting off fresh and maybe wants to jump in and, and dedicate some time money and resources to seo research yeah i, I, think I was gonna it must be frustrating for dealerships to hear about seo you know, it's like, I, I, I'm sure they understand it's important, and it is. We've conducted survey, surveys which show it's the number one topic that our dealerships want to, to learn about. But it must be very frustrating. It's like, where can you start? And, and sitting, sitting in the dealership seat, I'd be thinking about um, potentially reaching out to SEOs on LinkedIn. You know, let, let's um, trying to solicit. I'm trying to hack hack my way into the, into the SEO space now. Maybe you could solicit um, the services of an SEO um, working at another company, perhaps. Um, give them a few hundred bucks for an SEO audit. Um, sure, you can you can certainly work with um, our, our partners at Dealer Inspire if you have that budget. But um, with COVID and the pressures now. Uh, more so um, it, it requires different level of thinking to learn SEO you can go to the library and pick up a book SEO for, SEO for dummies it's a great book and um, learn pieces of SEO yourself and um, put aside an hour or two the thing is SEO is critical to the success um, within this ever increasingly reliant digital worlds and you have to invest the energy even if you do it yourself even if you reach out to people on LinkedIn leadership are welcome to reach out to me I'm happy to provide guidance um, yeah. and, and input and feedback um, but, but it's a challenge some dealerships have the budget and um, some people don't and those 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 individuals are going to have to either a learn it themselves with an hour a week um, or two reach out to people on LinkedIn and um, solicit people's advice um, mm -hmm. Offshore, get some offshore support potentially um, if you've got small budgets. Um, mm -hmm. Other, there, there are many other uh, ways if you've got a small budget um, to 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 crack the SEO um, space. I'm so surprised when they learn how affordable SEO is, like especially for dealers that are part of an OEM program. I mean, we'll you know, yeah. we've got packages through OEM programs at like seven ninety nine in a lot of cases, and when you compare that to how they're spending other marketing dollars, it's like, well, God, I'm like that's you know, nothing compared to what I'm used to spending shipping. Well, I also think a lot of dealerships struggle with SEO and, and, and probably why you see so much uh, uh, feedback from dealerships saying that this is uh, uh, a channel of, of, I don't want to say concern, but, you know, of, of them wanting more information around is there's been a lot, you know, I guess I'll just say snake oil. There's been a lot of, of crappy yeah. 
all. SEO providers in our industry. Yeah. Um, but they're saying, you know, and again, because it changes so it changes so much, changes so often. Uh, you know, I mean, I've worked with several agencies here just at this dealership, and you know, I, I've I found myself actually semi-educating the agency on SEO. You know, and that's not my job. Just I've I've got a little bit of knowledge around it. Um, you know, and sometimes it's just the most sim- simple shit. It's like, come on, guys. Like, I appreciate that you're 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 writing these articles for our blog, but you're not even you're not even following just the generic 101 best practices here. Yeah. You know, so that's it's very frustrating. I think a, a lot of dealerships have been burned in the past, and yeah. that's why they. Uh, that's why it's still to this day, ten to fifteen years later, such a hot topic. That's we get that all the time. We hear it from dealers all the time, and that's why we're so happy to like hop on a call and walk through at least a day. Like we're like, no, grill us. Like before you sign up, get on the sales call, ask us your questions. We will show you how we do our research. We'll show you how we do our planning, um, and it's it requires resources. Um, like if you look at the resourcing of, and again, I'm not any competitor, but like a lot of our competitors have really low margins and they can have specialists that are handling 50 accounts. And, you know, our specialists are handling nowhere near that because they have to do the research. They have to create the plans. They have to get on the call with the dealer. They have to discuss the dealer's priorities. They have to, you know, pivot in the moment. And that takes time. That takes resources. And you have to, that takes an additional investment from cars.com to understand that our ratios are going to be lower because we are going to put in the extra effort and do the extra work. Um, but that's also why we've, you know, written this guide. And I want to give a special shout out, especially to Kate Newens, who's on David's team, who did an amazing job really uh, doing a lot with this guide. And then Connor, my team, for providing a lot of this data with our major accounts. Um, but the more research that dealers can do on their own to understand SEO, the more equipped they are to ask the right questions. You have no idea what to ask when you're first thrown into this situation. But if you can start to understand theory, if you can kind of prioritize what's important, what's not important. You can start to have conversations with your providers that ensure you're getting somebody you can trust. Um, it is a lot to ask a dealership to take it on themselves. It is most often I've seen easier for a dealer to outsource, but you have to outsource to somebody you trust and that's gonna do a good job so you don't get bitten uh, by some of these other out there that are taking advantage of a lack of dealer's knowledge. And I, yeah. I hate seeing that, it makes me feel sick. Um, so start with the guide. Not to do a shameless plug for the guide, but start with the guide. That's I think right. it's a great job of giving a really high level overview of like general topics to pay attention to and understanding how multiple channels can work together. And then from there, start leaning into other resources. Um, I say when you're comparing providers do apples to apples, again, with that snake oil, a lot of times you'll see crazy things itemized out. Like I've seen stuff like CTAs. I'm like, really? You're calling it a line item, but you're putting a CTA on a web page. Like, we're really, how <laughs> aren't we? Okay. Um, so compare apples to apples and make sure you're getting the best bang for your buck. But I think most dealers, once they start researching SEO, will really be surprised at how much value they can get um, with, you know, not a large investment compared to other channels that they're used to investing in. Well, I just got, sorry, just to add, sorry, Alex. Oh, go ahead, David. I was going to say just one, one quick point to add to that. Um, you know, if budgets are tight, um, there are margin presses, pressures if, if time is tight, just put the users first. You know, you, you, you have this conversation right now. Um, this is great. You have listeners tuning in. This is great content. You're putting the user first. Put users first and SEO will follow. Yep. Yeah. Well, speaking of following, uh, I believe the two of you have gained some new fans today. Oh, cool. Yeah. David, you might be winning over some ladies. Um, That's good. It's coded. Yeah. <laughs> Technical coded. Sexy. It really is. <laughs> and Mary Grace, uh, I think uh, Christine Plunkett might be following in your footsteps or trying to at some point here. So You'll have to go back and read the comments. Um, awesome. But, but speaking of comments, can we uh, end on one last one uh, from the boss, uh, Alex Vetter? <laughs> he would. Uh, he's wondering if you can tell about backlinking and how reviews can generate authority. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so backlinks are are 
one of the most difficult parts of SEO. And again, you know, talking about where viewers get taken advantage of, like right here, this is where. Um, so again, you know, we focus, both of our teams focus on following best practices. And this is specifically why we do not include backlinking as a service in our package. We focus on creating amazing content for our dealers. That in turn will generate backlinks if you do the legwork of like connecting it to businesses. When you pay for backlinks, you get into this really ter hairy territory where like, what even is this website? Like it, ha it needs to be from an authoritative website in your niche for it to actually do something for your, for your website. But building backlinks is a critical part. Um, when we talk about reviews though, that's the other really part of the puzzle that people forget about. And again, it's because it's hard to do correctly. It is hard to get really, really good reviews or bad reviews um, without putting in the legwork. But it's absolutely true that when you think about the buying experience, you could have the one vehicle that this consumer is searching for. Like they've done all the research, they realize that this vehicle is at your lot and it's not at another lot for 100 miles away. But if they go online and they see that your salespeople are untrustworthy, they see that you're using manipulative tactics or, you know, they read a bad review about a uh, experience that somebody had, they're not going to come. Even if you have exactly what they want, they aren't going to trust your business and they aren't going to come and you're going to miss out on the sales opportunity. But a lot of times dealers let reviews run on the back burner. They don't put the energy into building them and then they don't put the energy into managing them. Um, and, you know, to be honest, we were talking about cars.com acquisitions, but I've been really impressed because every acquisition that cars.com has done has been to strategically advantage the consumer. It's not like about like gobbling up the little fish. It's strategically putting together a suite of services um, that helps with SEO ultimately, like it helps with everything, but ultimately it really is truly an SEO platform. Um, but you have to focus on that. So DealerRator has an awesome review tool. It helps you manage your reviews. It helps you solicit your reviews. It helps you showcase the fact that you have people at your dealership that other people in real life trust. Um, and if you aren't paying attention to that, if you aren't focusing on that, then you're missing out on the opportunities. I, I hate it when I work with, with dealers and it makes me so sad and, you know, we have awesome content on their website. We've done all these technical optimizations. Then I go to like their Yelp profile or their dealer rater profile or their GMB and it's like, nothing's there. I'm like, well, no reviews. Hold on. Yeah, or bad reviews, even worse. Yeah. It's 2020. Come on. Yeah. Well, just to follow on from that and, and briefly, I'll just again add without sounding like a politician, you know, if you do what's right for the user, um, you will succeed in SEO and backlinks and reviews tend to be a result of your great content. It tends to be a result of you putting the user first. Um, I, I stumbled across in, in doing some research um, for this conversation. I was doing some research about industry trends and I came across a Google article and cars.com had a link within the Google article. Google was sending us a link. We didn't we weren't actively looking for links. We just created great content and Google found it. So when it comes to links and securing reviews, again, do what's right for the user and create great content. And the result of that will be links and reviews. Don't do it artificially. You don't have to do it artificially. If you create that great content, I'm sure people will be linking potentially to this conversation right to today. And, and, and so user first SEO will follow as will the links and the reviews. Any, uh, any real quick best practices for a dealership to execute a backlink strategy? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, not, it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy, but you have to get good content on your website that's worth linking to. That's the step that people miss because that's the hard step. You have to have something worth creating a link to. If you think of it like a popularity contest, right? It's, it's the prom. The more votes you get, the better off you'll be, but you have to do something to get those votes. Paying for them ends up killing you. Um, so first of all, focus on that. Make your website a worthwhile destination to visit. Um, also, something we see dealers miss out on the opportunity. All of the dealers are so good at investing in their community. Like they yeah, participate, they go to these events, they support these schools, but then they're not asking for reciprocal help from the dealer or from the business that they're supporting. Ask. I mean, you know, we're always happy to do this for our clients. We say, you know, what are the community businesses that you're supporting? Do you mind if we reach out to them and just make sure that your support of their business is notated on their website and linking back to your website? And most of the time, these these businesses don't matter or they don't care. They're like, yeah, absolutely. That seems completely fair. But you have to put in that legwork and do that research and see, 
are these linking opportunities existing and am I actually getting them? Um, but that's the easiest way is reach out to those communities that you're supporting and make sure that they're in turn supporting you back. Yeah, that's the strategy I took uh, within our blogging platform was to just get with some local, you know, just the, the community, some local businesses, uh, run a different campaign here and there and, yeah. and just pick, piggyback on each other's, you know, it's always been pretty easy and successful way to, to do it. So we do local content for dealers where we'll like, and a lot of times I question it, but we'll build out blogs like uh, best restaurants that are doing yeah. takeout during COVID, right? And we're all dealers like, this isn't selling a car. Like, no, but you know, we're going to tell these restaurants that we talked about them and then they're going to highlight it on their restaurant website. And then you're going to get that benefit from having another local business link back to you. So it, yeah. direct implication, no indirect implication, huge. It's there. Well, Mary Grace and, and David, so it's definitely a pleasure. I think we could probably go on for another hour. I know I've got some more questions, but we'll wrap this up. Um, and we'll just uh, we'll make sure we have you back on here real soon because I'd like to dive into uh, maybe some things around analytics. And as a dealership does implement an SEO strategy, uh, what are some of the different things they need to look at from their Google Analytics or whatever analytics platform uh, they're going after? Because as you start to uh, branch out and you're going after uh, more eyeballs through your SEO strategy, your Google Analytics really start to take a different look and you start reporting things a little bit differently and uh, conversion of course typically can go down. So maybe you guys here in the future will have you back on and we can dive into some of that. Yeah, let's throw Search Console in there as well. It's a free tool, dealers forget about it and it's just so full of insights that you can take advantage of. and. Uh, Which get, one's that? Is Search Console. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Webmaster tools too. Like we get notices, flags, rankings, keywords, coverage issues, and it's all right there at your fingertips. You just have to know to go look for it. So love to do that with you guys. Yeah. Feel yeah. Free, uh, free, feel free to invite us back anytime. It's always a pleasure to see you guys. Um, thanks for inviting us on. Um, stay safe. You too. And all the, all the good you things. You guys as well. Yep. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks for the extra time, you guys. See you later. Uh, every time. All right. Bye-bye.